Mommy tried to kill me with a knife. Mommy tried to drown me while bathing me. She said I was stupid, dirty, disgusting. Slap across my face. She said I couldn't survive without her. She said dreams don't come true. Slap, smack across my butt. She said men didn't like smart women. She said sex was dirty. She said I was a tramp. I was to blame because daddy died of a heart attack. Don't talk back. Don't wear this. Don't wear that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't breathe. Don't live. Her rage was pounded into my bones. Daddy said, stand up, sit down, stop laughing, look pretty, scratch my back, make me feel better. Daddy pushed me away, go watch TV, don't think, don't feel, why didn't you protect me and hold me, Daddy? Little girls don't count. Who am I, Daddy? I am your daughter, Daddy. Why didn't you ever tell me I'm special or smart or pretty? Daddy went to his grave not knowing how he broke my heart. I left my body, escaped, given a glimpse of eternity and traveled inward, upward and outward as the stars sped by and I followed the moon into the galaxy, a little girl so small, trapped between the light and the dark, afraid to live, afraid to die. I was invisible to myself, my humanity, my womanhood, my divinity. So, where do I come from? Where, how did I wind up being who I am? Doing what I'm doing, making this statement, having this expression that I'm bringing forward to everyone. Um, where do I come from? I come from a little Jewish, Russian, Polish grandmother who came here from America with a bottle of schnapps and a pocketbook and a cigarette hidden in her hand and she was tough and she was sent here by herself maybe 16 years old and the rest of her family died in the pogroms in the holocaust I never knew anything about them whenever I would talk to my grandmother about them she didn't want to talk about them I knew nothing there was no pictures there was no anything there was no remnants no memorabilia nothing I only knew that there was this little blue-eyed, blonde-haired grandmother who had was widowed at 30 years old and never spoke, never, no, she spoke broken English and she never read English. She spoke Yiddish. She read a new Yiddish newspaper her whole entire life. And at 30 years old, she was widowed and she had three children. And what she did to her children is still beyond my comprehension because my she, she seemed to hate the daughters, she hated her daughters, and she seemed to love her, the, the men. She loved my father, she loved my uncle, and she gave them the money to start businesses from a little seamstress. She was a seamstress, she just sewed, and she had all this money tucked away in her, in her wherever, her cupboards, her glasses. I don't know where she tucked her money away from, but she always had money somewhere, and she was always giving me, you know, she would give the grandchildren five dollar bills, ten dollar bills, hundred dollar bills. And as a grandmother, she was a typical Jewish lady, but she wasn't a typical Jewish lady because she watched, I remember one time I was visiting her and she lived in her condo in Miami and she was watching Meet the Press. And I thought, what is this you know, little Jewish grandmother doing Meet the Press? And she had all of these political statements to make. She was obviously communist at one time when she was in Russia. And I was astounded that she had intelligence. Um, I never knew her from that place. But she was my, she made my mother crazy. My mother was completely insane, psychotic, delusional, uh, violent, rageful, abusive, hateful. Um, my grandmother, if you looked at her, seemed so incredibly innocent and survivor. Her children put her on a pedestal because she survived all that and gave them a life, gave them a roof, gave them a home. And yet, there wasn't an ounce of affection. There wasn't an ounce of warmth. My mother continuously craved her mother's attention. Continuously, she hungered for it. She starved for it. She died for it. She mutilated herself for it. She ignored her children. She beat her children. She screamed at my father who never was protected us from her, never 
um, in any way understood the ramifications of this rage and abuse. He, you know, himself came from a family whose father rejected him, told him he was nothing, had a mother who died of breast cancer, and caught his father cheating on his mother, and he built up a business from nothing. He built up this huge catering restaurant business, got involved with champion racehorses. He was a street guy from Brooklyn. He was, you know, charismatic, and my mother was beautiful, but they were crazy. And nobody knew they were crazy. Nobody knew. And probably half the block we were living on of Jewish crazy people were all the same and nobody knew it. And, uh, you know, I was brought up to just make it all look good, make it all perfect, make it all seem like we weren't from Holocaust survivors, that we weren't from crazy lunatic Russian peasant village, that we weren't poor, that we didn't scrape the walls and the ceilings to because we had such insecurities and such low self-esteem and inadequacies. We covered up my mother with a blonde hair and my father with this pink Cadillacs and their houses and their minks and their, their diamonds and, and inside of them they were empty. They were cold. They were starving. They were starving. They were just... And they passed this on to me and my sister. And at the time I was three, I knew, I knew that I was living in a crazy house. I knew. I knew. I knew what was ahead of me, and yet I also knew that there was more. There was more than what I came from. I knew this. I, my mother, every time she tried to be suicidal, or she tried to kill us, or she tried to threaten us in some way, I would just leave my body. And having those out-of-body experiences, I tapped in to some other universal knowledge that I didn't even understand. I didn't even know what it was. Yet I knew and I wanted to tell them, I wanted to show them, I wanted to I wanted to save them. I thought if I could save them, if I can help them to understand that I can help them to know that they didn't have to be crazy. They didn't have to hate. They didn't have to feel like they they, they had to annihilate themselves in the plan, that annihilation consciousness, the Jewish annihilation consciousness of just, you know, wanting to wipe yourself out, wipe everything out, and yet looking beautiful, achieving goals, having, you know, for a woman there was no education, not for a Jewish woman, not when I was growing up. There was no such thing as that. You were supposed to get married to a doctor, whatever, get money, have money, you know, whatever. That, but for a woman... To be powerful for a woman, to make money for a woman, to have a voice for a woman, to make a difference in this world, that was absolutely unheard of. My mother was collapsed and she raged because of that. And yet my grandmother, my grandmother was this woman who came over an entire ocean by herself, earned and earned money to survive and keep her family. She was this powerful woman, and yet she completely annihilated her daughters. Makes no sense. Made no sense. So, what did I do with that? What, what could I do with that? You know, I, could, I have that darkness in me. I have that insanity in me. For years, I, I struggled with it. I was terrified by it. I was grievous over it. I was starving for love and, and attention. And I could never get it. Could never get it. And I had to jump into my body and take that dark night, that dark night of the journey that they they, they write about in books and they, they write about biblically. And I, this 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 young woman, this little girl, this little Jewish girl who knew nothing, who was told nothing, was led into this journey, was led into this mystical journey, and I had no teachers. None. I I was just being called. I was being called to go into the dark night so that I can find the light in me, to find the Jewish eternal light that burns eternally. I had to find with no teachers. No teachers. I found the teachers. They came to me. And even then, they challenged me in such ways 
that I had to constantly, constantly find my own path in it, find my own voice in it. And this is my voice in it. This is my say. This is my telling of my story. This is my saying to you that I am in my own mythology, my own mystical experience. And one day, one time, I went to a rabbi because I couldn't understand how I could have these spiritual experiences, how I can hear voices, and of course my question, my schizophrenic, and particularly becoming a therapist studying abnormal psychology, I thought, oh my god, you know, I must be schizophrenic just like my mother. However, there is a thin line between brilliance and schizophrenia, and that's a matter of knowing how to use that energy, use that energetics, so it becomes a creative epiphany, it becomes a creative expression rather than a psychotic expression. And there's a very thin line between that. And I remember going to this rabbi and I wanted to share with somebody that I was having these visions, that I was, I was seeing things from the past, that I was having connections to my desert ancestors, that I was feeling the Shekinah, that I was seeing it. And I went to him and he turned to me and he said, if you have not done all the mitzvah, there's no way that you can be having this spiritual experience. You're an ignorant Jew. And that's what he said to me. I said, I'm an ignorant Jew. I'm having these experiences and because I don't sit and daven the way you tell me to. I'm an ignorant Jew. It was astounding to me. I felt I was a completely lost Jew, wandering Jew, the lost feminine. And this was it, my grandmother, the lost feminine. She came here to America to plant a seed of, the, of my female lineage. And she planted this seed that evoked the power of all of the survival consciousness, the Holocaust, the, the annihilation of the Jewish feminine, the annihilation of, of, of the soul of the Jewish people. This one little grandmother started this. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be sitting here speaking this. But in our society, it's been very difficult for women to be authentic and compassionate and at the same time, you know, not have to be nice, not have to please everybody about it, you know, not have to make sure everybody's comfortable, you know, if they're going to be authentic and, and assertive and real about who they are and what they're needing and wanting. And this, this, this this comes to the core of the conditioning that is so deeply 
embedded in us cellularly from, I mean, and it's hard to make this connection. I mean, we've disassociated that because when you think about that, it's 5,000 years. I mean, how can we possibly connect to 5,000 years ago? You know, it's hard. What we can really connect to is what's happening to us in our contemporary life and world. And our conscious mind has blocked out what's gone down over the last 5,000 years and has accepted as truth. So when you start to go into the subconscious place, when you recognize that what you begin to find out that every, mostly everything that's been told to you is a lie, it, it's very jarring and jolting and shocking and fearful to then say, well, how do I be real in this society that doesn't see that reality, doesn't understand the reality, doesn't know the history of that reality? has intentionally destroyed the reality of that. And now I'm going to go out and say, hey, you know, what went down 5,000 years ago is the reason why I'm a sexual addict as a woman or sexually codependent as a woman and don't know who I am as a woman. People are going to look at you like you're crazy. Particularly when they're telling you, get over your childhood. They're going to say, get over 5,000 years ago, you know. <laughs> get over it. What do you mean, get over it? I can't. How can I get over it? It's still going on. I mean, you know, these major, major patriarchal systems are just, their claws are just rooted into the earth till it strangled the womb of the mother. Mother, platinum blonde, Lana Turn is short, buxom, hard and cold, self mutilator, borderline personality, paranoid, possessive, no hugs, no kisses, frigid vagina, no warmth. Hollywood dreams of pink Cadillac, pink hair, white sparkly nails, gas the family, drown the children, puke and rage, Polish mother Sarah. Pogroms, Holocaust, death, hate, never enough, the vampire. I hunger for her bony fingers to touch me. Daddy, tall, dark, handsome. Marlon Brando, charismatic white smile, hairy body, controlling tongue, chauvinistic, charming, clothes horse, Gambler, drinker, smoker, heart attack, old heart, broken heart, needed his mother, needed his father, lost his mother to breast cancer, father to heart attack, needed approval, needed to be seen, white shirt, black pants, smell of pastrami, deli, catering halls, racetracks, poker games, look at me daddy, love me, I love you. The seducer. Sister. Mean. Cold. Jealous. Crooked tooth and eating disorder. Obsessive shopping. Cleanliness is godliness. Hated. Hated. Larry and Carla married. Doris Day and Rock Hudson. Twirler. High school popular. Pretty. Self-hatred. Paranoid, thick makeup, black eyes, big lips, straight nose, breast eaten with cancer, ulcer, paralyzed, phones in showers, maids dressing her, withholding, vindictive, victim, empty, needed, destruction, destructive. Her laugh shook the earth. She was the hurricane. I won't take it anymore. I won't feel it anymore. If you touch my skin, it burns of raw flesh, the void that grows, weeds between the cracks, blood that flows where lilacs once grew, 
I will fill the drops of rain to cleanse the scar. Forever I grow, forever I crawl into love's arms. I don't remember how old I was in this picture, but I must have been like two, three months, something. Um, anyway, somehow I evolved from this little innocent child into this very expressive teenager. And I started this door, uh, I guess around 15 or 16. I was. It, I was an insomniac, basically. Um, I didn't sleep at night. I had a really big problem falling asleep. So I get really restless and I just wake up and start right. <laughs> My cat's under. <winning. laughs> so I get up in the middle of the night and I just kind of start writing or painting or whatever I felt like doing just because I had nothing else to do. And, I would write my own poetry, and my own poetry here, and my own poetry here, and then I just would quote things from songs or from other poets and other poetry books, you know, this is from somebody else. Um, and not all of it really makes sense. Uh, so I've been writing for a really long time, and my writing is kind of a source to it's kind of my other outlet, you know, when I can't dance, obviously you can't dance around in a tiny little room. Um, so I would write and, you know, my writing has evolved through the years. It's not really for, I never really wrote it for any kind of public, you know, for sale or gratification or anything. I've actually been kind of private with my poetry and my writing. Um, my dancing has always kind of been more of a, um, outwardly, you know, known thing. So my poetry was kind of, I guess, my own personal way, you know, my own personal place to go and, and share my thoughts with myself. Um, and I guess, you know, I have, you know, I have a piece of poetry here that I'm going to read for you. And, um, it's something I wrote maybe like a couple of years ago and it was kind of, um, a culmination of a lot of different short little poems that I had just, they were all fragmented and I had been trying to find a clear way to connect all of them together because I had been searching for a part of my identity um, that I, I couldn't, I couldn't find clearly in others. Um, you know, I'm obviously a Jewish girl born in a very comfortable environment. Um, raised by two people who loved and cared about me very much and, you know, in a very, very lovely home in a lovely town. And um, there was just a lot of, a lot of things I wasn't feeling connected to and I, I kind of had to search for that on my own. So 
this is kind of one of the poems that has helped me define myself a little more and define my uh, connection to myself a little more. Um, it's, it's kind of a way for me to, I guess, admit the truth to myself. So um, I, I actually titled this poem, and I, I hardly ever title poems at all, um, but I, I titled this Generation. So I'll, I'll read it for you right now. <clears throat> and it's it's rough. I never really went back and fixed it up or anything. I actually just looked at this for the first time in a really long time. But I, li I like this poem. Um, so it goes. I gotta find myself. I gotta find myself. I, I gotta find myself. Words like whispers awaken the search. I, of Jewish breed, conceived 1978. Cancun sunflower seed. Transplanted to South Florida suburban shores. Baby girl trying to find the world with her baby toes. Dug into the sand, I learned to carry palm trees in my hand, willing them to dance. Fake crabgrass embedded in my ass and salt water dripping from my eyes. I looked to the painted skies and recognized the formula 411. Information that reads like the divorce from my memory, learning to relate to my fragmented fate. Splitting palm dress. Splitting palm, prom dress. I become the seamstress of my own destiny. Notorious Aries J.A.P. dances, chants, leads, puffs, makes love, gets crumped. I become the virgin mutated beyond manicured lawns and cross the border into spiritual songs. Over and over, I watch my community assimilate only to worship money and status, glad their dads and moms became doctors and lawyers only to worship them. So the hunt for the perfect lifestyle would become easy to obtain. Just follow the formula and let the rabbi explain. Except no dream, no memory, no shadow remains. And I travel through vacant gated neighborhoods, looking for signs of the earth and sky and eyes of other members of my tribe. And I've seen Elijah hanging out once or twice with Sarah and Lilith throwing back 40s and token blunts at my doorstep. Their voices wet with the same salt water in their eyes, same sand on their skin, because we don't come from green grass. We don't wander in desert, deserts and cross seas to find inner peace. To find myself, I must run away from fake religion that plagues me, this first born female of Jewish legacy. Gotta find myself like Talib Kweli. His train of thought reminds me that Brooklyn is the place to be, that hip hop is the ingenuity the creative beacon in the middle of my sleepless night. I, light skin, blue eyes like clear skies, purple heart, black soul, high dead sea scrolls rewritten by women in the harems of the goddess that tell me to find them a sugar and a bee girl that battles ambivalence like a saber-toothed sorceress. I've got to find myself in this poem. I melt into whispers of the Kaddish, praying to remember, living to forget, I awaken only to partake in the grander scheme, and I, find, and I find myself in between dreams, beginning to find pieces of myself in the little things. And I think, you know, you met me at a time when I was trying to be something other than what I was. And that's why I was so angry all the time. And, and the first thing, remember, if you remember when we first met, I said to you, I go to the psychiatrist three times a week, and my family's crazy, and if you don't want to date me, you don't have to. And you said... A bitch with bitch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I was such a naive jock at that, that time. And I was pretending to be someone I wasn't. Either. Well, that was the point. We both the lived, we, we, we had these fantasies about who the other was. Oh, sure. And you looked at me and saw this... Beautiful, voluptuous, rich. He thought I was, had some money, which I... I did. Didn't. No, my parents had money that they never gave to me. From my perspective, where I was, you and your family... Were well, because you came from a very poor family. You know, so you had built a fantasy around me. I built a fantasy around you that you came from this big, loving family. But I did. Yes, which, you know, really was an illusion. But they looked that way. Like, my family looked like this beautiful, perfect family. Your family looked like this loving family. And the two of us got together with this delusion.
about each other, and it didn't take very long that we began to realize what the hell are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? What am I doing here? <laughs> What secret do we have that we stay together all these years with all the insanity, hurt, pain, betrayal that we have perpetuated between each other based on the family you came from, the family I came from. You know, you looked at me and would see my mother, and I would look at you and see your mother. <laughs> physically, <laughs> intense emotionally, intense spiritually, not knowing who I was coming home to every day of the week, and me who had dinner every night 5.30, and I can tell you what was for dinner every night of the week, I can tell you what my clothes were, my shirts were, my suit, to come home in this environment, and I thought I was cool and contained, and I was platzing inside. And I can only say that where I generally am an external person and not afraid to do a lot of things physically and couldn't understand how Marta was afraid to do a lot of things physically and externally, she's opened the door for me internally and subconsciously and spiritually that probably I was more scared than Marla was ever scared to do anything physically. And it's been a door that I am ever grateful for. And it's helped me to grow and to learn more about true life and existence than I ever could have possibly. And it's made me see myself in a much more grounded, authentic way. Yeah.